you absolutely need to build trust with your employees and you need to build trust with your customers. And this, this is a big thing with your marketing as well. So if you look at the core values that you have as a business, those core values have to be believed by the employees, and then they're going to join that team. They have to trust you. And that trust is based on intuition. Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast, an auditory journey through the latest in marketing, branding, and advertising. Now, here's your Marketing Expedition Guide, Ray Allen. On this week's episode of the Marketing Expedition Podcast, I get to speak with Sunil Godsey, and he helps entrepreneurs scale their businesses to eight figures a year by implementing his intuitive branding process to create a trusted brand with their employees and customers who are directly responsible for their growth. And with hundreds of entrepreneurs who have successfully scaled their businesses by implementing the intuitive branding process, the advice simply works. And we're going to talk all about the different types of intuition and the signals that come from them. And he's got some stories to share about how this helps entrepreneurs grow their business. So stay tuned for that. But first, it's time for our Marketing Essentials Moment the basics that you need in order to continue to help you build your brand and your bottom line. We're talking about creating a request for proposal. So as an ad agency, we will sometimes go after a proposal when people are requesting a proposal from us. Well, I wanted to flip it around and actually talk about when companies or brands or entities need to create a request for proposal. And I actually have been able to help entities create the RFP for to then put it out to bid for people to then work for them. So it's kind of fun on the flip side to be able to do that, to understand what people are looking for, especially when we are the ones who sometimes have to fulfill and do the proposals. So when you're in this situation and you want to think about working or having an agency work for you, there's lots of different ways to go about it. And there's ways to kind of critique the agencies that you're wanting to potentially hire. And so they put these requests for proposals together. And then sometimes you you can grade them, rank them, however you choose, and then invite them to do an oral presentation. And so I wanted to cover some of those things because I'm seeing lots of different ways that people put RFPs out to solicit to get a marketing and or creative agency or PR firms or any type of creative service or marketing service that can come to them. So, and obviously requests for proposals can be in other industries too, but I'm going to specifically talk about the agency world. And if you're looking for an agency or wanting to work with an agency, there's lots of different considerations on how to do that. If you've never done it before, or maybe you're just not happy with the one that you have, that happens too. So maybe it's time to go out to RFP again. Uh, in some cases for government entities, they may be required to do it every five years, one year, or maybe they'll have a five year with option to renew every year, however it might be. But I want to cover some of the basics that might be useful to you when you are creating an RFP or wanting to hire another agency. And you know, sometimes if it's a government entity, you're required to get three or more bids. Uh, maybe if you're a private entity, you get one, but sometimes it's a good idea to get more than one, unless you're just doing business with based on relationships, which we also love, because if we have the relationship and it makes sense and we know about the brand, we believe in the brand, then sometimes we don't necessarily have to compete against others doesn't always work that way. Sometimes if you are new at this process, being able to get different proposals from different agencies help you to make a good decision, to make you feel like you've made an informed decision. And sometimes it's really hard to compare apples to apples if you don't lay out parameters for them to then give you their proposal. And so then if you have no parameters and they've done a proposal, and then it's comparing apples and oranges and it's just not the same. So sometimes you can identify how you want the 
agency to respond to your RFP and you can lay out the RFP questionnaire that then all the agencies would answer and then do it in some systemized process to be able to at least get somewhat of an idea of how to make your selection criteria based on the responses of the proposals. And then you can always narrow it down. If you get multiple proposals, you can narrow it down maybe to your top three or top two to then allow them to come do an oral presentation. Or in some cases, it's on Zoom because we had to do that during the pandemic. But if you can think about the different areas of focus that you want to include in your RFP, first of all, thinking about how and what it is that you want them to propose. What specifically are you looking for? Maybe you can determine what the scope or maybe even determine if you already have a budget in mind. Sometimes that's useful. Sometimes it's, I don't know the budget until we get the proposal and they propose to us what we think, what they think we need. So at least a good place to start is what is the purpose and what are you going to accomplish? What do you want the agencies to fulfill for you? And so that's going to be the the uh, first things first, right? In, in your proposal, why you want to do it, why it's important that you go through this process. So there's that. Then you're going to want to give some details about the project or the campaign or the company that you need the agency for. If it's a very specific project, if it's a kind of a, you know, contract for one contract or one campaign versus an ongoing relationship with the agency, right? Maybe it's a, you're going to want it as a retainer on an ongoing basis and, you know, for as long as you want until it's, you know, you want to dissolve and go out for RFP again. Or it's um, however you define it for your organization. If it's grant funded, maybe it's for the specific campaign for the grant, whatever it is. What are you looking to accomplish? Who is it that you want to send this out to? Who are the agencies that you can select to send it to that you want to receive it? Again, government entities, you may have to get it sent out and post it to, you know, through a procurement process. But if you are a private entity or have the ability to send it out to agencies that you are vetting in advance, maybe looking at their website, looking at um, previous work that they've done, maybe it's similar to the industry that you're in, maybe they've worked in another area, maybe they've worked for a competitor and they're not their agency anymore, and maybe now you want to pick them up because they, you know, missing out or whatever the case might be. Maybe they have lots of good industry information. Maybe they service the industry in different territorial areas, so it wouldn't be a conflict of interest for them to work for you as well. But look at those agencies that you want to send the RFP to. And developing relationships with the agencies actually would serve you well because sometimes when we go through, as an agency, we go through the go or no-go process. We want to know if we have a relationship established with the people who are putting out the RFP. We want to know what we know about the company. We want to know if it's, you know, the likelihood of us getting the work. Those are helpful. So actually having somewhat of a relationship with the people that you want at the agencies to then submit for your RFP, because it's a lot of work to put together an RFP. And if you're going to make people go through this process, give them some kind of indication that they were selected or that they were chosen to be putting in for this RFP because it increases the likelihood of them wanting to go after it, right? Uh, Because it does. We invest a lot of time and energy and effort in creating customized proposals sometimes, and we want to know that we would have a chance in hell to get it. So it's helpful to do that, right? And then, okay, so after you identify what the needs are and what, you know, if you want project per project or if it's ongoing, then understand what you already have. What is it that the agency is going to need to create from scratch versus what can they use that you may already have established or have in your brand equity? Do you have design assets already? Do you have a style guide or a brand book or a brand guide or whatever people call it? Because they've called it many different things. But what kinds of things can you supply to them that you can really be clear on that will help solidify the scope? Because if you don't have any of that, the agency needs to know that they're going to be starting from scratch and that will impact the pricing that the agency puts on their proposals. So it will help you narrow down the, the scope if you 
understand what you already have at, at your disposal that you want to keep, what's working, what's not working. Sometimes we'll start off before we even do proposals or anything. We'll do a marketing needs assessment just to understand where we're at before we go and propose because we want to know what all needs to be recommended in the recommendations of our proposal of what needs to be done. And, you know, just because you've been doing something one way forever doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way now. So what is it that you need? What do you need to stop, start, keep, tweak, or doing that then needs to go into the RFP or not? And so those are some other things, understanding what you have and what you need and what your marketing needs are. So sometimes that's what we'll do is we'll start off with a marketing audit. We do charge for that because it's a lot of work to invest in to make sure that we're understanding what the needs are and what our recommendations are going to be based on that information. It's always an ideal situation when you can do an audit first and kind of take a look under the hood if you're a mechanic. Let's say I want to look at all your analytics. I want to look at, you know, kind of benchmark the things that you've been doing, what's working, all that. Know what your limitations are. If this includes the budget or the resources, maybe um, you're short staffed and don't necessarily have somebody that can be dedicated to work with the agency versus, oh, you're wanting to hire somebody or um, budgetary restrictions, right? What I, What is it that you need? It's always helpful when we know a budget going into it so that we can propose and make our recommendations based on our budget. But sometimes I understand people don't know what their budget's gonna be until, they, until we tell them what it's gonna take to do the work that needs to get done. And sometimes during my marketing audit process, I will help people discover the budget that they need to be spending based on our observations, our insights, industry knowledge, things like that. So those are some other things to consider. And then when you do come down to selecting the agency, check for fit. What is their culture like? What is their attitudes, their beliefs, their, you know, their systems, their processes? Do they have thought leadership in your in the specific industry that you are in that the agency could then utilize and leverage? Or are they going to have to learn from scratch based on, you know, the industry that you're in that maybe they've never worked with before? Or maybe they haven't worked. And maybe sometimes it's an advantage if they've never worked in your industry because now you're going to get different ideas that are outside of the box for things that have worked for other companies that are different than yours, but maybe similar. But, you know, it just really depends. Uh, looking at the fit, looking at their case studies, looking at the work that they've done previously. Is it in alignment? Is it good? Is it going to hit your target audience. And sometimes you are not your own target audience. You might be selling to somebody completely different than yourself. So what you may like is maybe not always what your target audience would like. So put yourself in your own target audience shoes and think about what they would like and the types of people that you're serving as a company. Who is it that you're serving? And has that agency worked with those types of people before? They, they may have some really good insight in the types of people that you need to attract to your business. Anticipate some problems. Think about what kind of questions people might ask or the agencies might ask about, you know, what kinds of things are going to be deal breakers for you. Think about what it is that they're and how they go about charging you. Um, you know, do they track change orders? Very important things that we need to think about. And in my you know next episode, I'll talk about uh, change orders and the importance of change orders and understanding the, the, the significance and how that works, right? Does the proposal, do you need it to talk about some of the legalese and what is it that you understand about that legalese? You know, we have things in there in ours about, you know, copyright uh, law, right? If you supply something to us that you um, have given us, we don't want to be held liable if it's something that's breaking copyright law because it's something that you've provided and want us to use. Um, we have a little disclaimer in there so that that helps protect us. You know, who's going to own the files at the end, the working files, right? Who has the ability to keep those and maintain those? And now we do what we call a buyout if people want to take all of our proprietary, you know, files and things. So that way it protects us both. And then you have ownership of that if you want to buy out of all of our creations of things, right? It's kind of like when a builder has all of his tools, right, in his toolbox, and he builds your home, he then hands over the keys to your home, and that's his final finished product, but you wouldn't take his tools from him. 
you know, you wouldn't take all of his different tools that he's collected over the years. So sometimes we have to have conversations about ownership of files and we're happy to do a buyout of ownership rights there. Just thinking about what that looks like for you. And usually it's not that much of a problem. If people want files, we can certainly work with them to do that. Uh, but there is some some ownership that we have to charge for in order to make that happen. And it's to protect both of us, the client and the agency. So there's that to consider. Yeah. And how do they bill you? Is it a flat fee? Is it, you know, how do you want to be billed? Is it hourly? Is it a flat fee? Is it a retainer? Is it, you know, a set amount, time and materials, lots of different things about how you could incorporate that and ask those questions in your request for proposal. And then, of course, it's always helpful to have dates and deadlines to follow. Sometimes people will say, okay, you can ask questions by this date. And then the questions that are asked get sent out and uh, sent out to all of those who are intending to propose. You can even ask for an intent to propose so that you know who is all actually interested in proposing. And you can talk about the dates that you intend to make a selection and the dates that you intend to have oral presentation, like a time frame, right? A range of time frame, which I do recommend having a range of time frame because not everybody's going to be available on the specific date that you may or may not set. So that's always helpful to be a little bit flexible with that. We've had to miss out on something because we had a big other client project and they had a date set and that was what they were set on and wouldn't budge. And so it was, it was devastating because we'd put all this wonderful work and effort into it together. But you know what? Our paying client at the time took priority and we missed out on being able to do the oral presentation. So just if you are doing this, just have some flexibility and understanding because we also, you know, need to make a living too. And there was no guarantee that we would win it. So uh, I guess it kind of worked out because maybe we wouldn't want to work with somebody that wasn't flexible and understanding like that anyway, right? That was my rationale for it. <laughs> anyway, talk about the budget. Uh, talk about the dates, um, you know, budget, timeline, establishing what the next steps are, who your contact's going to be with the agency, um, all these things to consider when you're putting out an RFP. Always, if you want help, we have several examples that we've worked on with our previous clients. We've actually even helped an entity just for the purpose of creating their RFP since we've done it for 20 years now. On the flip side, knowing what kinds of things we need in order to respond to the RFP, what we like to see as an agency in an RFP. Um, always happy to help if that is something of interest. And of course, it's always an advantage when you know what's going to be on the RFP if you go after it too. So there is that. And um, with that said, let's get to the interview. Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. I'm your host, Ray Allen. I'm the president and CEO of Pepper Shock Media and the founder of the Marketing Expedition Community. And today's guest, we have Sunil Godsey. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Ray. I'm looking forward to this interview and talking all about intuition and its role in specifically marketing and entrepreneurship, is, which is your jam. Absolutely. And you're, you're calling all the way from London, Canada. Yes, absolutely. Just outside the hot spot of Toronto. So uh, uh, great in the summers, a little bit cold in the winters. That's right. That's right. Well, I, I'm looking forward to your interview today as well and uh, talking intuition. I think this will be a fun topic for us to explore and, and all the things that you've been doing around this. So first, let's just share with our audience maybe a bit about your story and kind of how you got to where you are now. Just give us some history and, and some things along the way that uh, can give us a, a more in-depth background on you. So yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I'll give you sort of the, uh, it, the whole journey kind of started after writing, uh, to get into intuition really kind of uh, started with my first book, which was called Fail Fast, Succeed Faster. And the premise of that book was that if you were to study others who have failed, uh, then c conceptually, if you read them and didn't repeat those failures, then you should be able to succeed faster. Um, and the one, one thing that I, I kept looking at is that like I kept getting asked every time I used to speak on stages with about the book what's the one thing that uh made others uh, you know actually succeed where some didn't and I, I you know at that point I kind of reflected saying well there was like close to 300 entrepreneurs that told me all kinds of stories of failure and I didn't really tie down any one particular thing until I started going back to the audio recordings and when I went back to the audio recordings 80 to 90 percent 
of the entrepreneurs said that the reason that they had failed was that they ignored their gut, they ignored their intuition, or they should have listened to that voice. And so I got like, I, I just thought, wow, I just missed this commonality. So when I started diving into the academic research, what I found was that intuition is a lot more complex than we think it is. And so I, I looked at four types of intuition, and we'll get into the sort of the different types uh, in a little bit here. But what I found is that those that kind of failed, uh, failed because of the four types of intuition, normally everybody is stronger in one of the four types. And when the other three types of intuition are starting to send them signals to stop making a decision because it's the wrong one, because they're weaker in those other three, they're not able to sense that signal. And so that's why they fail, even though their intuition, which we're all born with, is saying you shouldn't be making that decision. And what I ended up finding out is that those entrepreneurs who actually took the time to strengthen the other three types that they were weaker in were able to sense those signals of danger, and then they were able to succeed past the hurdles that they had. And I used to reflect back, you know, if, if I look at the, the journey that I had with these, these types of intuition, you know, I, I distinctly remember that, you know, I got into engineering because I'm a South Asian uh, male. So there's three career doors, this doctor, lawyer, engineer, and I picked door number three, but something was telling me that this was not the career for me, that I actually wanted to be an entrepreneur. And three years into that journey, uh, you know, I told my dad that I'm not going to be an engineer anymore. Uh, I actually wanted to run a business. And he never spoke to me for a number of years. Oh, wow. um, but the very first entrepreneurial venture I had was as a private investor in a Mexican restaurant chain that came up from Mexico. And we were making first year two and a half million dollars and then uh, three and then five, ten. And it just grew from there. And wow. so, of course, I made money on the dividends. And then I, I got into entrepreneurship with four or five other businesses that got me $20 million in collective revenues before, you know, going on to consult and coach. Yeah. But the one key thing is that when I ignored my intuition or any of the three weaker ones, then that's when I had problems. And I just simply remember going down to Silicon Valley and there was a huge client down there. Uh, uh, it was SAP and a huge client, big contract. But the contract terms kept changing. And I talked to somebody in the HR department saying, why are these contract terms changing? Uh, they shouldn't be. And my some of the other intuitive types were signaling that maybe I should back off. But the money that they were throwing at me was so lucrative that I said, I got to go down there. And when I went down there, they didn't pay me. Oh, no. And yeah, I, and they, I emptied my bank account just to move down there. Uh, and they never reimbursed me. So I came back with literally 23 cents in my bank account wow. at a time that I was supposed to be married and, uh, you know, that was, that money was gone. And so this is where the importance of really kind of relying on the intuitive types and strengthening the other three became a really, really important piece. And so when entrepreneurs uh, go through the journey of strengthening the, the, the four types of intuition, then they're able to sort of build this sort of trusting relationship where you're able to look at the decisions that your intuition is saying, this is the right decision to make, or this is the wrong decision to make. And so it really comes down to these four types of intuition. And the four types of intuition, if you're looking at building a brand, there's a ceiling that as an entrepreneur, as a solo entrepreneur that you reach, and that's about, let's say, half a million dollars plus or minus. Uh, and then if you have employees, you reach a ceiling of about maybe a million and a half to two million based on my experience. And I've gone through about a hundreds, a couple of hundred entrepreneurs now that, that I've helped uh, coach. Uh, and if you want to get to that next level or we want to scale to eight figures, then this is where you absolutely need to build trust with your employees and you need to build trust with your customers. And this, this is a big thing with your marketing as well. So if you look at the core values that you have as a business, those core values have to be believed by employees and then they're going to join that team they have to trust you and that trust is based on intuition and if you look at the scientific research that intuition happens in as little as 33 milliseconds that's how quick it is and up to 10 to 14 seconds before you actually make a decision so that trust is very quick so an employee has to believe in your mission they have to believe in you as an entrepreneur and then you have a two-way trusted relationship and that employee is going to stay and then when that employee stays, then they're able to drive the proper marketing messaging because now they're talking to the customers. They're figuring out what the problems are with marketing. And essentially, your marketing messaging has to touch all the four types of intuition because, as I mentioned, everybody's going to be stronger in one of them. So you don't know which one. 
So if you have a marketing messaging that, that spans all four and you're, you're looking at problems or, or value add to your customers' lives, then their intuition is going to take a look at your brand to say, hmm, you know what? I think I kind of trust this brand. Let's go dive a little bit deeper into what this brand is all about. And now they're starting to use their intuition to trust the messaging, make sure there's consistency in the brand message, and just basically saying that this is not clickbait. This is actually a company that has products and services of quality that can help solve my problem. And that's really kind of your marketing stack. And that's really, I mean, your traditional marketing funnel. So you kind of go from sort of awareness to uh, consistency, and then you build that trust up. And again, it's a two-way trust, and that leads them to a purchase. And so that's how sort of the four types of intuition really kind of work through the, the, the different steps that I have. Um, and so uh, once you have all the four types of intuition, in terms of your messaging, your core values, the people you hire, the positions that you offer, and the sales that you offer, you're now on the path to scaling to eight figures because everything is working in sync. Yeah. And then when it doesn't, then that's when you, you know, like we call it the gut check, right? <laughs> if it's <laughs> Absolutely. And, and then you get stuck, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, if it's not working, well, the revenues will, will, will show you, right? And so one of the common misconceptions is that when you talk about intuition, there's no data involved. And, and that's not simply not true. Uh, you know, data is a laggard indicator. Uh, and what it shows is that if you look at the data, it shows that what happened. And so if you get stuck at half a million to $2 million in revenue, and you're not able to break that ceiling, even though you're spending so many hours trying mm -hmm. and get frust getting frustrated, then you got to take a look back, look back and say, well, why can't I scale? And so this is where you use the four types of intuition to figure out, you know, what's going on inside your, your uh, business, uh, and then outside your business. Uh, and so that's essentially what my intuitive branding process does. And by the end of it, uh, normally you'll get some quick wins because what you're trying to do is you're getting rid of some of the fat that you've had through some emotional decision making and a number of entrepreneurs immediately get within the first three to four months a hundred thousand two hundred thousand and in some cases five hundred thousand dollars worth of cash coming in or cost savings because they're trimming the fat that they didn't need to have for their businesses and once they have that then they become a well-oiled machine to go on to the next uh, scaling level and that comes pretty quickly generally in the year, a couple of years uh, this fastest I've seen is about a year and a half where they've gotten to about 13 and a half million dollars uh, and then they just scaled beyond that. So can you give an example of uh, maybe a client that you've helped kind of, like you said, trim the fat that went and was able to scale? Like what happened? How, how did they go about it? What was the process that they went through in order to do that? Yeah, so absolutely. So the first thing that we did with there was a two, two co-CEOs and they were sort of in the massage therapy, physiotherapy uh end of things. And so they were running about four clinics. Each clinic was approximately about, about I'd say, two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 uh, in revenues. And the big problem they had was there was a trust issue. And so the first thing that I dealt with for both the co-CEOs is I got them in a process of strengthening the other three types of intuition that they were weaker in. So we took the first month or so to work on that. And they had a bunch of worksheets uh, where they were able to take a look at making the right decisions based on the four types of intuition and the signals that each type of intuition give it, was giving them. The next thing we looked at is, okay, let's, if, if, when that's a problem, they were struggling. They had about six months worth of cash flow left and a number of employees were actually looking to leave. And I didn't realize this until I had conversations with a lot of the employees. Um, and so the next step is that we looked at the employees saying, okay, let's listen to them. Let's put them in the right roles and responsibilities that is meant for their skill set and let's actually listen to them because they they are at the front lines what kind of advice do they have for us to improve our business and so once we were able to listen to the employees we were really able to get a sense of where that scaling path would be and consequently what we also found out was there were a number of employees that just really didn't want to be there and they didn't want to join and so very very quickly uh, there were a number of employees that were let go with the appropriate packages that we mm -hmm. gave them. Uh, but that immediately saved about $150,000 uh, right away in employee costs. Right. And if employees are there that, that don't want to be there or not a good they fit. They just did not want to be there. Yeah. It's, it's costing you more than it is not anyway. So that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And they were actually sabotaging a bit of the, the, uh, the ability to run the business because they were purposely putting in uh, hurdles that uh, would stop uh, progressing. 
So the next thing we worked on was we looked at, okay, so now we, we've kind of trimmed the fat there. We kind of realigned our employees. Now we can start hiring the right employees properly using the four types of intuition again to put them in roles that are suited to them. And that now brings on a huge team of management that we can go. And then the two co-CEOs now took a step back. We hired a nice level of managers to really work on the expansion plan. At the same time, I got them to work from instead of a, a, a business that was two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars and you know about three four hundred three four hundred square feet of space to treat patients, we really quadrupled the space and we went to close to about one point five million in revenues with a larger space in a different city, and we really concentrated on the customer not being sort of a client or a patient but the customer really being a customer uh, and treating them the minute that they came into the door, that experience has to be golden from that or the marketing messaging we send out to the point where they get treatment and to the point where they, get, where they actually leave and encourage them to come back. So when we looked at you know focusing on hiring the right management, then we focused on the marketing messaging to bring the right people in and that's when the doors just started flying open. And so that one and a half million dollars expanded to a second location. And then we started growing that to uh, the second year was about 10 million and the third year was 13 and a half million. Um, and at that, at that point that I stepped away uh, and then they had they had uh, gone and expanded much more than that. So um, and then the sales also was in, in, in figuring out, OK, so what do these customers want? They're coming for physio and massage. But, oh, you know what? They have sprained knees and orthotics and perhaps, you know, bracing so now we opened up a bunch of products that we can sell. We bought product employ, you know, experts to come in to have, you know, sort of lunch and learns. And that or expanded some more revenues on top of the massage and the physio that really added to their treatment. Um, and so they, it was kind of this holistic treatment that they really loved. And their physicians were happy because now these, these patients are really doing well. They're telling the physicians that this place is amazing. And that started even more referrals coming from the physicians. And so that's a, yet another sign that uh, this this company was just really ripping it really well. Yeah, they were building trust and then accelerating word of mouth because they were doing a good job and had the right people in place. That's amazing. So, OK, let's back up, though, a little bit, because you said using intuition to hire the right people. Can you give me an example of how you would use your intuition or one of the four types in hiring because you said you know we got to get rid of the people that aren't wanting to be there that are not a good fit so let's think about that process that they had to go through in order to hire the right people maybe give me an example of like how how you do that what kind of questions are you asking how are you finding them like walk me through that process because that's huge yeah, absolutely. And so, so this is where you, so this is the four types of intuition become that the pillar for everything. So let's, if we're looking at a hiring uh, process. So the first, first of the four types is called experiential intuition and experiential intuition is really about the past learning experience that you've had. And so what you want to take a look at is for a particular position that you want to look at, what is the experience that you want someone to have? And you have to be very realistic. Don't look at pie in the sky what what are the experiences that you want to have that somebody may currently have and experiences that they're going to need to really kind of expand them in that role and so once you have that set then whatever candidate that you have you that's who you match in terms of their resume so that's the first one the second one is called relational intuition relational intuition is all about how you are with other people and so this is really kind of teamwork based type of skills so in that position that you have especially for management um, you have to take a look at what type of teams did they uh, work in or with? Was it a product or service? And really making sure that the skills that you need in teamwork match the skills that you need as a company. And so when you when you have that in the interview stage, well, first of all, you look at the, the uh, resume to make sure that they have worked on teams. And then what you want to do is in the in the interview stage, you actually want to ask questions, situational based questions to, to see how they contributed to the team uh, is as a leader, how they contributed as a follower, what kind of team projects that they have to really flesh out what it really is teamwork and how does that help your business. Uh, then the, the third one is going to be situational intuition. And this is where you're dealing with problems that come up in a situation. How are you able to handle failure? How are you able to handle hurdles? How are you able to handle a task that you didn't know of? 
And that's going to be hard to kind of get at in, in, an, in a resume. And this is where the interview becomes really important because you want to throw a couple of situations that that person may get into uh, and to get a feel for how they answer that. Now, the other thing you have to think about with intuition is that you're also watching that person's body language. And everybody, every single person, of course, we're born with intuition is going to know with, whether somebody's telling the truth or there's something wrong with that story. Again, within 33 milliseconds, there's something not right. So somebody can be making up a story and you'll instantly know that there's there's something not right. The dots aren't connecting. Um, you may want to ask a follow-on question to get some clarification. Perhaps you're not understanding what the situation is, but you still want to make sure that your intuition is okay with the answer and it actually makes sense. Yeah, so they're not just trying to tell you what you think, what they think that you yes. want to hear, but actually yeah. getting to the root and truth of what they truly feel, not what they think you're going for, what you want them to be. Yeah. Exactly. And because there's a lot of canned questions out there, right? And canned answers. And you really want to detract away from that, where you can you can look at specific situations or specific teamwork exercises that kind of throws them off. And when it throws them off from a canned response, then you're getting them to really truly talk about that experience. You're, you're, they're thinking, they're pulling in some history, uh, and things really kind of make sense to you and to them, obviously. And then the last one is called creative intuition. And creative intuition is about making, uh, I'd say, uh, educated guesses or risks, taking risks within a certain framework. And so being able to be creative, do things that are slightly different from the norm, because a lot of that creativity is going to be necessary in the role so that, you know, you get away from the mundane tasks and you find the sparks in maybe a marketing message uh, or how you treat a customer um, or how you manage someone uh, and the unique decisions that you make. And this has to be a risk that that person ha is comfortable taking. There are some people who are not, they're not, they're risk averse. So in an, say an accounting position, you don't want to get too risky, but, you know, in a marketing or a sales position, you want to have some element of risk. Um, where they're they're doing some messaging that's really really new or novel, uh, and that's going to you know get the attention of the potential customer, and so you have to kind of gauge again what's that creative intuitive risk that you want, and then once again this is where you go into the interview stage to ask them these specific questions. So if you were in this situation, uh, for example, if it's a marketing manager, let's say if you had an employee that was really not doing well, uh, you know what were some of the unique things that you did to support that employee so that he or she could really thrive in the roles and responsibilities that they that they had. Or if you were a mentor, what was some of the unique uh, pieces of advice that you gave that really helped someone, you know, take off? And so there's that element of sort of risk or, uh, you know, unique decision making that creative intuition allows you to do. And if it's too risky, then your, your creative intuition is going to send you a negative signal saying, no, 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 that's too risky. Uh, you know, and so there's always those signals that intuition gives you to give you that that element of risk within a comfort zone that you have. So that's how you have the four types of intuition specifically for a hiring position. Oh, that's great. So experiential. Experiential. Then you have relational. Relational. Which is about the people. Situational, situational. which is the situation. And then yep. creative. And creative, which is the ultimate uh, decision making. Ability. Which is my favorite. <laughs> yes, yes. I love, I love, love that. I'm sure I don't need to throw a bunch of statistics and percentages at you for you to know that most of us spend too much time staring at screens. Being able to consume your content on the go means that your clients and customers can listen and learn from you without being tied to their desks. With Hello Audio, your customers can put their phones down, power off their PCs, close their MacBooks, and get the information they need from you while they're, let's say, walking a dog, doing a jigsaw puzzle, washing the dishes, maybe when they're in the car or exercising on the treadmill, sunbathing in their garden. Well, Hello Audio makes it incredibly easy for you. No more hours spent trying to figure out tech settings or trying to make a square peg fit into a round hole you can click publish on an audio feed in a matter of minutes and have control over who accesses what. So visit peppershock.com slash offers and sign up for a free trial of Hello Audio. Excellent. Okay, so tell me more. I want to dig in a little bit because um, I, I love the stories of how you've used this to help people grow. Is there another client that comes to mind to you that's like, oh, I got to talk about this too, because this is yeah. really important in how we display what our creative intuition does for us? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's we'll go through the, the four types of intuition as well. Uh, and so, there's one particular uh, person. His name is John Rosteld. And so, what my one of my very very first interviewees uh, was John. And John was an investment banker for 25 years, and he didn't believe in intuition at that time. You know, if you're an investment banker and you're sitting on Excel sheets, you're black and, and white, drives, right? It's, it's you're black and white, black and, and white. it's data. It's yeah. yep, <laughs> yep. It's you know V lookups and H lookups and whatever else Excel sheets do. That's that's decision making there. And so he says, okay, look, Sunil, you know, I understand you're, you're trying to look at something on intuition. Why don't you come and, and talk to me? We'll talk about intuition for five minutes. And then, you know, the rest of the hour will catch up. I haven't seen you in a while and we'll have a nice latte together. And I said, fantastic. So I'm driving down to see him and I'm just worried now saying, okay, wow, this is gonna be a very short interview. <laughs> um, and so I, I turn on the camera and I start telling him about a couple of CEOs that have gotten some unique signals. Um, you know, where one, I had one CEO who's now run two multi-million dollar businesses by seeing an omen pop up on his right shoulder. And so if he's thinking positive, uh, uh, you know, hiring someone or going a strategic way, then this omen pops up and, and he actually takes those decisions. Uh, and he's grown two major, major companies wow. based on that. Now, he, of course, he won't tell his board of directors that <laughs> because they might think, you know, he's got to go visit a psychiatrist. Right. He might um, be a little you know, crazy. What's so, going on? <laughs> exactly. So he has to he has to bolster that with some data, some strategy. So that's where you kind of use the intuitive thoughts. But you have to have the data or the strategy uh, to make sure that that make, becomes realistic. You just can't pull it out of the air. And I think this is, again, one of the biggest misconceptions about intuition. Like your intuition knows that there's a path. You just have to figure out, okay, uh, the intuition is telling me that this is a strategy. I need to find the data to support that because it's there. Your intuition mm -hmm. already knows it. It's, it's kind of like the inner voice that's talking to you that you should listen Ex to. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yes. That's exactly what it is. And that's if you have an inner voice, that's your signal, right? Um, and I also told him of another uh, entrepreneur whose who's left earlobe gets hot every time he ignores his intuition. And so wow. every time he made a, a bad entrepreneurial decision, his left earlobe kept, kept getting hot. Uh, and then that's when the, the ones that he avoided. And if he ignored that and he got into that entrepreneurial venture, he lost money every single time. It happened three, four times. So John was saying, okay, look. He would not uh, be a very know, good love... poker player because then people would know his tail. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Oh that's, my a, goodness. that's a very, very, pop, very bad poker move. Uh, wow. So John's saying, well, okay, uh, omens and, you know, left your lobes. Okay, I, you know, I'd like to shake these people. And he said, listen, um, sometimes, you know, uh, it, look, your decisions that you make are based on experience. And I said, I absolutely agree. And so now we're getting into experiential intuition. And I told John, like, sometimes, uh, you know, you may have all the experience, but sometimes the data doesn't match the situation that you're in. And, you know, it goes, you, you make a decision that goes against the data based on your experience. And he goes, well, that's funny that you mentioned that. He said, I have a story for you where he was looking at opening up a franchise location in this particular dilapidated area of Toronto. And his team looked at the data and the data said, this is a five and a half out of 10. And they looked at like traffic patterns and, uh, you know, development in the area and things like that. But he went there and his, his intuition was saying, no, that doesn't make sense. Uh, now he was saying, he was saying uh, perhaps it's intuition. I'm not sure, mm. but he says that, uh, I made a decision to put that location there, uh, because it just didn't make sense. And that ended up being one of the locations, uh, with, that had, uh, one of the best, 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 uh, numbers when he when he put that franchise location called the beer market um, and it was one of the best performing franchises in his whole portfolio wow he had to so go against John's, the odds against the data against the yes. people telling him no and stand Absolutely. up for it and and come up with the the reasoning behind it it had nothing to do with the data Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, so now he's kind of getting it. And then there was a situation that came up where he said, okay, I don't think I want to be a coach anymore. I actually want to run a business. And so he was telling everyone, I'm going to leave my investment management career and I just want to start a business. Now, this is where relational intuition comes in mm -hmm. because all the people who he thought were supporters of this idea, because now he, something inside of him was telling him he needed to do that. So this is the language he's been us he's using. Uh, and so now he's kind of getting it. And all these people who were concerned about, you know, high end restaurants and limousines and uh, helicopters, all these people who are used to that lifestyle. And, you know, he was making three to four million dollars a year. We're saying, you're nuts, John. But yet not one of them really kind of bothered to stop to ask, well, why? And the only person that asked him was his wife. And so when he asked his wife or his wife asked John, why do you want to do this? He was saying, 
It just feels right. And so now there's that signal that's coming up. And so if we now move to situational intuition, now he's looking for a business to buy. And so you would think that his intuition based on his experience would give him, you know, a business with good cash flow, you know, solid revenues, but not his intuition. His intuition was saying, well, here's a situation where there's this almost bankrupt, tiny restaurant. That's what you're going to run. Wow. And then the last one was creative intuition because ultimately he had to make the decision to actually walk in those front doors, a very risky decision going from three to $4 million a year to basically nothing. And he, and then this is what he quotes on the video. Sunil, sometimes you can have all the data in the world, but you have to trust your intuition. And he quit his three to $4 million a job walked into that tiny little bankrupt little restaurant. That restaurant was called Eastside Mario's location number one. And over the next 20 years, he grew that into a $2 billion behemoth before wow. he sold it off all because of yeah. intuition. Wow. Hmm. And sometimes you're right. Sometimes you just have to go with what you feel is right as opposed yep. to Absolutely. what everyone else is saying or what the data might be saying or anything. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's yep. amazing. And, and so I ended up, I, yeah, and I ended up working in, with him on another uh, couple of ventures as well. So we looked at a couple other startups and we took them up to uh, the 10 million plus range and uh, it really, really worked well. So. Well, and sometimes that's what they say is like analysis paralysis, right? If you get stuck in the weeds of the data, you can't actually make the right decision because you are in that what if scenario or the, you know, you're just, you're just paused because you can't make that decision. But if you can at least look at any one of these types of intuition, it could help you mm -hmm. for sure. And one one of the things that what you want to also do is, is, is so it, let's say you have a lot of very hard decisions. Like we make about 30,000 decisions every single day. It's crazy. Uh, but some of the, for the more, you know, more harder ones, what you want to do is you actually want to step away to get into what I call an intuitive medium. So what is that, what is that, that thing that you do that gets you to think really clearly where you cut out the noise. And so you can allow these intuitive thoughts to come in. You can listen to the signals that each of the four types of intuition actually give you. So for example, for me in the shower, I get a lot of intuitive hits when I'm lying down with my girls before they go to bed. Uh, when I'm driving uh, to Toronto from London, that's about a two, two and a half hour drive. Uh, and so I, that's where I have my, uh, you know, intuitive hits. Some people like to cycle. Some people go to the gym. Some people swim. Uh, some people go for a walk or some people just like to, you know, just sit back in their chair. So whatever that is for you, it's, it's unique. That's when you can cut out the noise and listen to those intuitive thoughts and really kind of um, map out the four types of intuition. So in the course that I have, uh, we have worksheets that they do. So as soon as they get these intuitive hits, they write down that decision for that type of intuition. And they have to pair it with an intuitive signal. And if that a signal is positive, that means that they have to make a decision that's good for that intuitive type. If it's a negative signal, you want to take a step back to say, okay, can I change that negative signal into a positive one? And if I can, then what do I need to do? So do I need to hire someone? Do I need to ask someone about his or her experience? Do I need to change the situation? Or do I need to make more, a more risky decision? And these are sort of different signals from the four types. And if you're able to turn that negative signal initially to a positive one in the second iteration, then you've solved all four types of intuition. But if any one of them is still negative, you have a bad decision. And the problem is many of us get emotional and will push through that, even though our intuition is saying not to. Right. And there's where the failure happens. Yeah. No. Can you can you share like an example of what that negative intuition, what, what, what yep. would be that trigger? That signal? Yeah. So for uh, so a good one for me uh, is uh, when I when so when I had a, I had a clothing brand that I was working with and we were pretty unique in the retail space and we had a private label as the first thing and one of the unique things that we did was that we had on Thursday nights when the mall was dead we got the administration to approve putting a DJ in our retail location <laughs> so th Wednesday nights and Thursday nights was basically uh, it was request night and so we had two universities in that uh, city. Uh, and so we would attract the right type of crowd mm -hmm. for the price point. And that was when we had Buffalo jeans and Levi's and <laughs> Mundetta was a big clothing line. So we had the price point there and we had our private label and we had dancing people in the windows and it was just a riot. And so we, we really increased our sales really, uh, really well. Fun. We were expanding to another location. And then the business partner I had wanted to cheapen the price to maximize the profit. 
And instantly, one of my negative signals that happens is I lose focus. My peripheral vision loses focus, and I and I look straight forward. Mm. Uh, and when that happens, there's something wrong with what he said. Mm-hmm. And so when that, and and so I'm about quality. I'm not about maximizing profit. Uh, so that went against sort of my values as a business person. Uh, and he wanted to expand into a location that wasn't close to the universities. And so I said that you're taking away, you're moving away from the demographic. It's great to get a second location and it looks good, but you're going away from university students who may need a bus ride just to come or keep it convenient for them to buy. I don't think we're going to get the same revenues at this other location, which is way on the other side of town. Uh, Even if you he, he reduce was, the cost and, you know, try to sell more quantity versus quality. Yeah. If, if the people can't get there. They won't buy. Yeah, and it's also it's also perception of brand, right? So if I, if we're selling cheaper clothes, you know, they already have a sense of quality with our first one. And the second or third piece, if they if it's you know it's if you're losing color or it's losing shape, uh, you know, as as you keep wearing it, uh, and this goes to thread count, and so this is now the we're getting to the technical aspects of clothing, sure. which we had to learn, of course. Um, that's not a brand that I want to have, right. and so I'd rather you know shrink the the profit, but have people wearing quality longer because they're going to buy more. Um, and so that was a fundamental shift. My trigger signal was there, which was my negative intuition. And I said, look, you need to buy me out because he was really emphatic. And we got, we came to loggerheads. Uh, I ended up by, uh, he bought me out and, uh, he did expand to the second location and everything tanked from there. And the quality just went down the tank. And I was just, re- it was, it was hard because I was part of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and to see that kind of go, um, was hard, but you know, again, there was, there was my negative signal triggering saying, no, this is not right. And so even though we might've made more money, the, the it sounded good with the second location, everybody's interviewing us because we're two, uh, you know, great people expanded in the city. So we're on magazines and radio shows and all that stuff. Those are just ego strokes. And that doesn't, that doesn't make great business. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, um, yeah, taking a step back was a big, big, big trigger for me and it ended up being the right decision. Yeah. I'm glad you listened to your intuition to say, oh, absolutely, absolutely. you got to buy me out because <laughs> that's hard, right? Because you've built this and you've made all this happen and then now suddenly it's going to change direction. And yeah, that's, that's a hard decision. I get it. And the beauty of these, these, these signals is that it, it removes the emotion out. So if I'd listened to my emotion, which is what I was just ex- yeah. explaining with the ego and the radio podcast yeah. and the radio shows and all that, I would have stuck in the business and it would have, it would have, it would have been okay, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, it eventually would have died and right. that would have gnawed at me internally. And so that's the beauty of using, listening to the four types of intuition and the signals is it removes all that, 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 uh, emotion out where there's a balance of emotion and logic. And when those two things are balanced, mm-hmm then you're making a, an extremely good decision. If you're too heavy on the logic, that's the analysis paralysis you're talking yeah. about. If you're too heavy on the emotion, now you're on ego and dopamine mm-hmm. hits with no justification of the back end logic or strategy. And that's where the mismatch happens. And that's where the four types of intuition really balance those decisions. Out. Well, I'm glad you took the time to figure all of this out so that people could absorb it and learn it and do something with it. <laughs> that's good. Absolutely, that's good. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and especially when entrepreneurs go through this journey and like even when they first start to say that they want to to become an entrepreneur, I mean, you experienced mm-hmm. that with your father, right? To say, I'm mm-hmm. gonna, you mm-hmm. know, step out on my own and and immediately people will just be kind of this negative roadblock that you have to get past because they they may not be entrepreneurs themselves or they don't, you know, yep. haven't experienced it and they don't want their, you know, maybe they maybe are risk adverse and those types of things, but I think if you can follow what is right for you and it's not going to mm-hmm. be right for everybody else, right? You have to go through yep. your path and figure that out. But by the way, yep. um, how is your relationship with your dad now since you brought that up earlier? Oh, amazing. Good. Amazing. I was hopeful was, that you would amazing. say that. <laughs> yeah. He, he actually came to my first book launch okay. and uh, he had no he had no clue. It was uh, my book launch. I was at a convention center. My branding was everywhere. We had close to 300 people wow. uh, at that event that had paid $150 or more to come. Oh, what a proud uh, moment and, though for him. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And, and he was just, he was in, and he actually I didn't realize it was my event. And, and he said, well, why is Sunil always on stage speaking and introducing everyone? And at some point he got an intuitive hit, uh, you know, during one of our sessions, he goes, this is my son's event. 
oh my God, this is my son's event. And then he went to all these groups. I'm Sunil's father. I'm Sunil's father. That's that's my son over wow. there. And so, and so one of my friends was watching my dad and he just had that this intuitive moment. Oh my gosh. And from that moment on, we were just, we're just as Good. close as anything now. Good. Good. I'm glad that you got to do that and share that with them and, and have that Absolutely. journey. That's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Speaking of, uh, you know, inspiration and, and things mm-hmm. that uh, influence you, where do you go to get your information now? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you read mm-hmm. certain things? I always love to share kind of, you know, things that our audience might want to research more or resources that mm-hmm. you might, uh, you know, share. Yeah. So, so there's a number of uh, way, areas. One is obviously podcasts. I listen to a ton of podcasts, uh, especially if I go to the gym or on the road. Uh, so, and, and funny enough, we're talking about marketing. A lot of them are about their marketing related. Um, and so that's where I get inspiration. In some cases, there's others where I hear stories of people like the rags to riches stories on other podcasts. And there's usually an, an intuitive wake up call moment that I can actually use as a piece of content somewhere else. There are some books that I do follow uh, people who are like Seth Godin and, mm-hmm. Um, there are other people and I, I also have a podcast I'm relaunching and so I'll get some guests there and so I'll get their books and I'll go through their books um, and I'll look at sort of intuitive movements there that they've had that might inform you know another piece of content or something to think about like hmm that's really interesting that this is sort of their angle for marketing or sales I never thought about it that way um, yeah and trying to keep busy from that way um, and then actively teaching into my two daughters both of them they're 11 and 16 so they both run nonprofit businesses wow and so even them, you know, talking at a very basic level about uh, decisions and, and uh, you know, not formally with intuition, but just getting that feedback from them. Sometimes, you know, they'll say something like, hmm, that's really interesting. You know, I never thought about it from that perspective because I'm always looking at it from mo- almost a more mature level. Yeah. And they're looking at it from a very creative sort of raw level. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes they say things like, like wow, you know, that's really interesting. Hmm. I didn't think about that angle. And so, um, you know, so that's another area that I uh, get some inspiration. Oh, that's awesome. Why don't you share how people could reach out to you if um, they're interested in how they can get your book and, and all the good mm-hmm. things? <laughs> Absolutely. So the book's available. Uh, you can go to Amazon. I've got the audio book on Audible. Uh, you can go to SunilGodsey.com. I'm on all the social channels, uh, either Intuitive Branding 101 or Sunil Godsey. So feel free to, to shoot me a DM or Go there and check out my uh, my uh, stuff, and I'll be looking at a uh, launch of the YouTube channel July nineteenth, and so there'll be tons of uh, content on sort of the science of intuition and some case studies, and then some some uh, intuitive branding knowledge, and I'll continue to add that uh, once per week. Excellent! I just sent you a LinkedIn request, so now we can be connected on awesome. LinkedIn too. <laughs> awesome! Awesome! I'm Very looking forward good. to that. Well, thank you so much, and I really appreciate learning all about the differences in intuition. I mean, I think people just inherently should know that they've got some sort of intuition in them, some voice, some gut check kind of thing, but now laying it all out and having different areas of focus, I think that that is definitely going to be beneficial for people, whether they're in the entrepreneurial journey or the marketing journey or, you know, a leadership journey, wherever they might be in that case. So thank you for sharing. No problem. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And for those of you listening who want to share this with others, we would applaud that because that is so awesome to be able to get our messages out there. And of course, uh, your reviews are always helpful as well. And until next time, everybody, enjoy your marketing journey. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. Want to continue the journey? Don't miss out on new episodes. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. Wouldn't it be great if there was one place you can go to get all the latest information and tips about marketing and advertising? The Marketing Expedition community is that place. People like you gather in our online community to build relationships with others and find the latest marketing trends, tactics, tools, and technology. We help you build your brand and your bottom line. Start your adventure today. Visit themarketingexpedition.com to find out more.